thank you, sir. <laughs> Well, my talk tonight is on the cosmological singularity, um, and you might wonder why on earth should uh, people who are interested in computers be interested in such an obscure um, entity as the cosmological singularity? Well, I hope to describe for you why you should be fascinated by it. Um, we use the, we being mathematicians, use the word singularity to denote something that's intrinsically infinite. The example is the Big Bang cosmological singularity where time began about 14 billion years ago. We can now measure the time when time began to four significant digits, a fascinating fact that our science is so precise we can measure that to four significant digits. The singularity is called the singularity because the energy density of radiation was not just very large, but literally infinite. Now the fascinating thing is that the Einstein equations which govern the behavior of the universe as a whole and all gravity say the Big Bang singularity must have existed. We don't have a choice in saying that it doesn't exist. It has to exist. Now the other laws of physics besides Einstein's equations actually require the universe to end in a final singularity where time will end. Remember, time began at the Big Bang singularity. It will end in the final singularity. These laws which require the existence of this final singularity, first unitarity, which very few people who are not physicists have ever heard of, but it is a fundamental law of quantum mechanics. The next one is the Big Bang, uh, the Breckenstein bound, which you can think of as a computer. Here's the first word computer coming in. A computer version of the uncertainty principle, which I think you've all heard of. And finally, there is the second law of thermodynamics. Now let me describe in a little bit more detail um, this unitarity, which you've probably never heard of. It literally means that you can think of causality as working backwards into time. What happens today is actually determined by the ultimate goal of the universe. I bet, bet you never guess that this is a fundamental principle of physics. Used to call it teleology, but it is actually physics very central to quantum mechanics. Reason it's central to quantum mechanics is because it's implied by the conservation of energy and it has in addition a huge number of experimental testable um, implications. It's actually been confirmed to no fewer than 11 decimal places was the most precise test of any physical law. Think of it as measuring the distance between the cities of New York and Los Angeles to within the width of a human hair. Really precise measurement. Unitarity is good, ladies and gentlemen. Now here's where it gets interesting. Hawking proved that unitarity would be violated if black holes completely evaporated. Now we know astrophysical black holes certainly exist. And we also know that if the universe were to expand forever, these black holes, these astrophysical black holes, would completely evaporate for certain. What do we conclude from Hawking's calculation and the fact that astrophysical black holes certainly exist? We conclude that the universe cannot expand forever, because if it would, unitarity would be violated. The Einstein equations then tell us that the universe ex either expands forever, but that's ruled out, or it ends in a final singularity. Voila, the universe ends in a final singularity. But that's just the start of deductions we can make from physics. As I said, the Bekenstein bound is the uncertainty principle stated in the language of information theory. What it does is constrain the maximum complexity of the universe, and this is complexity at the micro level, at any given time. For example, the maximum complexity of all the universe we can see, it's out about uh, oh, 040 billion uh, light years, 
um, we call it the visible universe. Its maximum complexity is 10 to the 123 uh, bits. And this we call the Penrose number because the great mathematical physicist Roger Penrose was the first to compute it in the 1970s. The maximum complexity of the universe at the beginning of time, zero, and that has implications that the universe was initially perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. If there was any variation at all, it could not have zero complexity because variation, that's complexity, as you know. This, incidentally, in passing, solves a major cosmological problem, namely, why is the universe perfectly homogeneous and isotropic? That's observed to be, well, laws of quantum mechanics, which Bekenstein bound is a consequence, doesn't allow any other possibility. All right. Now, if the Bekenstein bound were to apply in exactly the same way, at the final singularity, it would also have to be zero, and that would be the case necessarily, as Bekenstein himself proved, if event horizons actually exist. But zero complexity means that the total entropy of the universe would also be zero at the end of time. But as you know, entropy is non-zero now, and the second law of thermodynamics tells the entropy can never decrease. It always has to increase or stay the same. So if the universe were to go to zero complexity, to zero entropy at the final singularity, it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. What forces the universe to approach zero complexity at the final singularity? the assumed existence of event horizons. Conclusion, laws of physics require event horizons to be non-existent. Conclusion from that, astrophysical black holes cannot be true black holes, i.e. you fall in, you can never get out again. Certainly astrophysical black holes exist, but what this means is, since they're not truly surrounded by event horizons, the information that falls in can, in fact, get out again. And I mentioned in passing, this solves the black hole information problem. Now, Roger Penrose developed, I mentioned him before, a great physicist, developed a way to attach a singularity to space-time and also to give the singularity a topology. Each distinct event horizon defines a distinct point of the singularity. Therefore, if there are no event horizons, then in the Penrose topology, the final singularity must be a single point. Give it a name, since it's the absolute end of time, let's call it the omega point. Now, I mentioned in passing that in Penrose topology, the Big Bang singularity is a little bit more complicated. It's what's called a three-sphere, a three-dimensional version of the surface of the Earth. The experimental evidence for no event horizons. This is where it gets really interesting from the physics point of view. No event horizons at any size. Well, you can't have them at any size if uh, you're not ha having um, event horizons at all. Then that makes a quantum mechanical problem called um, renormalization. That affinity is eliminated. And it also eliminates all infinities from standard quantum field theory. Now, another implication of this is that the interaction constants, which describe the forces of, uh, between the particles, electricity, electrical force, electrical attraction is the one most familiar to people, since it, everyone knows about electricity, if you know about computers. Um, it implies that the interaction constants actually increase in time. This has the following Im implications. The Higgs vacuum, which gives va uh, the mass to all particles, it must be metastable. It's almost on the verge of becoming unstable, but not quite. That's what we mean by metastable. This has actually been observed when CERN finally detected the Higgs boson. It also solves this increase of uh, interaction constants, the so-called lithium problem in cosmology. As to the, you've probably never heard of it, but we uh, cosmologists are intimately and painfully aware of it. There is three, to too much, three times too much lithium-7, that isotope of lithium, um, than standard theory 
expects. But if the interaction constants increase with time, problem is solved. So we have actual experimental evidence for no event horizon. How can we have evidence for things going on in the future? Well, remember unitarity tells us what's happening in the future is really determining what's happening now. We think, we humans, that causality is working from past to future. Nope. It's also perfectly legitimate to say that causality works from future back into the past. Okay, now here finally we get to computers, which is your area of expertise and interest. No event horizons requires the far future computers, which will exist, they must exist, because they have to go out and grab control of the evolution of the entire universe. My goodness, why make such a statement like that? Laws of physics are fascinating because they require us to make statements like that. Preventing formations of event horizons on the largest scales, cosmological scales, is exceedingly unlikely to occur without intentional guidance of the entire universe. You can look this up in the math, the detailed calculations, they say the evolution of the universe in the case in which the event horizons total disappear is of measure zero. Measure zero states are not permitted in the evolution of the large scales. That's once again a violation of the second law. Now only computers can survive as the universe approaches the final singularity and it goes to zero um, size. Now I'm not going to tell you, I only have 18 minutes left, I can't give you a complete detailed course of mathematical physics. If you're interested, I've described this in my book, The Physics of Immortality, um, which is available also in Italian um, translation. But let's review a brief history of the future, which was required by the laws of physics. This century, people like you guys and gals will develop true AIs and human uploads. They're basically, in my view, the same thing. Now, notice in passing that true human immortality is impossible unless you upload yourself because the memory capacity in this computer we call the human brain is limited. You can calculate uh, how much memory is stored in the neurons to roughly a thousand years worth of experiences. To date, we don't run into that problem because we are lucky to make to a hundred years. We can live ten times more, but if you had ultimate medical technology, the best you could really get is a hundred years worth of experiences. But if you upload yourself, an unlimited number of experiences. This is in the, this century. Next century, AIs and human uploads will expand into interstellar space and engulf the entire universe, gaining control of the entire universe. Now, this is a fascinating view. Um, it requires a no event horizons, require a literal infinite number of acts by computers between now and the final singularity. You have to push the universe in first this direction, and then this direction, and then this direction an infinite number of times um, to eliminate event horizons, but also simultaneously you have to do that in order to have an energy source that will allow an unlimited number of, com of computations. You have to ha have a divergent energy source, a source of unlimited free energy, and the collapse of the universe into the final singularity will provide it if you have these computers acting in the far future. Now, um, an infinite number of acts by computers between now and the final singularity actually will imply, as I said, I've worked it out in my book if you want the details, computer memory capacity and processing speed also increase to infinity as you're approaching the final singularity. True infinite experience life, true immortal life, is not only allowed but required by the laws of physics. The computers in the far future will be so powerful that they can be recreated. Humans, 
all the humans that have ever existed can be recreated as emulations in far future computers. You have an unlimited amount of memory. Remember the complexity of the universe is uh, bounded above by 123 uh, bits of information. So if you have in the future an unlimited uh, diverging amount of computer memory, which the laws of physics require, then you can emulate the entire past history of the universe. And remember an emulation is a perfect simulation. A perfect simulation is the thing itself. In physics we call this the principle of indistinguishability. It un, it's, can be shown indistinguishability to form the basis of what's called the Bose-Einstein condensates. And also Chandrasekhar was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics when he showed this phenomena of indistinguishability. No difference between the real thing and the, its emulation um, for proving that this fact resulted in a method to hold up white dwarf stars. Brilliant calculation. Okay, now I can say in conclusion from this, if we're guaranteed in the future to have uh, this immortal life, to literally live forever, if the laws of physics be for us, who can be against us? We're going to win, ladies and gentlemen. Now our mind children if our mind children can simulate us in the computers of the far future, I'm sure every one of you has wondered, perhaps we are now living in a computer simulation. Of course we're living in a computer simulation. Why do I say that? Because a simulation, let's think what it is. By definition, it's in the broadest possible sense, just a mathematical model. The laws of physics, in particular, are a mathematical model, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence reality. We basically have had a theory of everything for 40 years. Unfortunately, many of my colleagues will not admit it, but it's pretty obvious. Mathematics is very clear. Um, the laws of physics are a mathematical model in one-to-one -one correspondence with reality. So the laws of physics ultimately are the universe, which means we are a simulation. The true interesting question is not whether we are living in a simulation, we are, but what is the complexity of the situation in which we live and what is the complexity of the programmer? As far as we can tell, there are no bugs in this universal simulation in which we live. As you are well aware, as gamers, bugs are basically contradictions in a program and we know from a matter of elementary logic that anything can be deduced from a contradiction. Bug free means that the complexity of the mind of the programmer is greater than the complexity of the program. Why do I say that? Well, you know that you can very easily write bug free programs that maybe have, oh, 10 lines of, uh, of coding. That's not too difficult to get completely bug free. Once we get a thousand lines, a million lines, ten million lines, hopeless. Because ten million lines is way beyond the complexity of our normal minds. But the Bekenstein bound, recall, tells us that the complexity of the universe today is bounded above by 123 bits, and also that the complexity of the simulation the entire universe will diverge to infinity as the final singularity is approached. That's required by the absence of event horizons, by the consistency of the laws of physics over all time. Thus, the true complexity of space-time, not just this instant of time, but the whole shebang, not only of space, but also of time in which we live, that simulation is actually infinite. Hence, the complexity of the programmer must be, typo here, not finite, must be infinite, he must be a singularity. You see, I've got some contradictions here. The, um, uh, uh, there are a few typos, which I am entirely responsible for. That means this brain is not infinitely complex. I make mistakes only a programmer which is truly infinite can avoid um, making mistakes in the basic um, program. So the program 
must be intrinsically infinite. As you recall, as mathematicians use the word, the programmer must be a singularity, and I use English he not to apply any sort of uh, humanity or gender, just that's the English language to reply to um, an intelligent uh, thought. Now you in the audience, as game designers and gamers will play and are playing an essential role in developing the programs that will eventually become the AIs and human downloads. You ladies and gentlemen are now working right now, continually, to making us all immortal. Thank you. So let me ask, are there any questions you would like to pose? No questions at all? Ah, I see someone. And I hope I will be able to hear. Hello. I, I hear you. Um, you said that uh, causality in the... Um, in the previous physics, we knew that uh, it worked from past to future, but now you said that quantum f physics implies that it also works from future to past. What does that mean? Uh, well, you can think of the... Uh, these are equivalent um, descriptions of reality. You can think and do calculations assuming that causality works from um, past to future, um, many physical problems can easily be solved in that language, or you can address questions in which causality goes the other way. The traditional word is teleology. That is, causality works, the final state of the universe is determining what's happening now. That is, we are doing certain things today in order that this final state of the universe will be approached. That's the way to think of um, unitarity. As I've said, this is a very central principle of uh, quantum mechanics. So, in time, you work in physics, you get used to it. Because it has enormous number of implications. And um, one of the um, points made about the importance of unitarity, it's implied by the law of conservation of energy. Unitarity might... Um, and put it differently. It's possible for conservation of energy not to be true and for unitarity to still be true, but the reverse is not true. If conservation of energy, if unitarity is violated, then conservation of energy is really violated. Leonard Sustin, a professor of physics at Stanford University in California, illustrated this by saying unitarity, were it to be violated, would violate energy conservation on enormous scales such that if you were to turn on your microwave oven, so much energy would be created out of nothing that the entire Earth would be blown apart. We know, of course, that can't happen, so unitarity is good. It's just counterintuitive because we automatically think of causality working, determinism working from past to uh, future, but unitarity says it's perfectly okay if we want to think that the causality works in the other direction. Physics say the causality can be thought of as working in either direction. I hope I've answered your question. Any other questions? Yes. Good evening, sir. And so you basically say that we are in simulation, right? Yes. And we are creating our immortality. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Uh, we are creating our immortality. Uh, okay. We are working towards yeah, the AI programs, to, yeah, which will eventually create. take over the universe. And um, it, I don't know how many people will manage to download, excuse me, upload themselves um, before they die. I imagine you have a good chance. You're a teeny bit younger than I am. I'm 70 years old. I probably won't make it. 
myself, I will probably have to be brought back into existence as a computer emulation in the far future. But you might be able to upload yourself. The technology is not there yet, but you guys are now working on this, and so you are working for the immortality of every one of us. Not only me, but you of course, but also everyone who has ever lived. But even more than that, one another thing physics tells us is that the earth is for certain going to be destroyed. We don't know when. Once again, I call I can give a series of upper bounds. One upper bound is the sun is now burning up its nuclear fuel. It's used about no oh, half of its nuclear fuel. It's got another um, 10 billion years to go. But once it uses up all of its hydrogen in the core, it will start burn helium. The sun will become more luminous and its outer atmosphere will expand out and destroy the earth. That's what will happen within 10 billion years. We think that that's the actual upper bound is even less than that. The sun, as it becomes more luminous, it's 20% more luminous than it was in its early youth, 4.6 billion years ago. Um, so it's hotter, it's, we're giving out more radiation now. Um, give out more radiation even more in the next billion years. People think that the atmosphere of the earth will become unstable and the oceans will start to boil off. Global warming for sure caused by the increase in luminosity of the sun within a billion years. We know the earth is going to be destroyed if the humans uploads and AIs and copies of all living things in the rest of the biosphere have not been preserved before that happens, the whole biosphere will be wiped out. But by developing the AIs, by developing the capability of uploading any living organism into the computers, then the, the expansion of the biosphere of the earth can begin. And the destruction of the earth will no longer wipe out the life, all life on earth. So not only are you working for the survival of the human race and yourself, you're also working for the survival of the biosphere. Good for you. Yes. Anyone else? Did you have a question? Okay, so this is all very fascinating and, and quite impressive, to be honest. Um, today we uh, attended another very interesting speech on human conscience and how the laws of physics may not be able to fully interpret the life and, 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 and the universe in general. How would you see these two theories match? Well, obviously, I think he's wrong as a matter of physics. Sorry? I think he's wrong as a matter of physics, and I know who he was. He did a tremendous work in the development of computers, namely uh, the first microchip. We know that. We know, but I think he's wrong here, because I think that we know more physics than we knew um, when he developed that in um, the 1960s. I was um, working as a minor technician at Texas Instruments. You know Texas Instruments invented the microchip at the same time that Intel did. There was a huge fight about They eventually decided credit um, works both ways. But um, the point is, I was there. I was an undergraduate then at MIT working in the summers at TI. And um, I can say for sure that we know far more physics now than we did in those ancient dark ages of 1965. And in particular, it's the Bekenstein bound that ultimately tells us that certainly consciousness is a physical phenomena that can be mapped into a computer. Um, we do, uh, uh, the only debate is on the complexity of the computer required. Until we actually do it, we don't know for sure. But I remember um, reading, when I first started um, lectures like this, people were claiming it is not possible to develop a computer that will defeat a human world champion in chess. 
that is utterly forever beyond computer technology. Needless to say, you know we have computers to do that. The humans have long before been defeated in this. So claims that humans cannot be emulated by a computer really is saying that humans are not subject to the laws of physics. Nonsense. Everything in physical reality is subject to the laws of physics. The claim otherwise is vitalism, and I am a vehement opponent of vitalism. I claim that human beings are subject to the laws of physics just like this machine is subject to the laws of physics. We're all machines. I'm more complexity than that. We all are more complex than that. Still, however, subject to the laws of physics. And that being the case, because we are subject to the laws of physics, we are potentially, actually in truth, truly immortal. Thank you. Okay.